YouTube! So it's the end of another month, which means that today's video is a book of the month video. And this month I have been reading Sense of Occasion by Hal Prince. If you're new here, hello, my name is Tori Cyclic. I make new videos every Sunday for Cyclic Sunday with other videos throughout the week. If you like what you see, like this video down below and subscribe while you're down there as well. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram in the description at TSS6295. Now, let's get into the video. So in choosing this month's book, I was just trying to find a bunch of books that I have on a huge running list on my phone in Barnes & Noble and couldn't find any of them. But then I looked into the theater section and found this one about Hal Prince. I bought this at the end of July, I think maybe a week after Hal Prince passed away. So I was like, this is a good book to read because I don't really know much about him besides that he's like a big deal producer and director on Broadway. And I saw the Prince of Broadway show, um, musical review, when it was on Broadway last fall, I think it was and I really really enjoyed it and didn't realize how many shows he had actually worked on so it was good for me to like go and actually read this and learn more about Hal Prince who is like a massive deal in the world of theater. So the thing that I didn't know about Sense of Vacation before reading it is that it is Hal Prince's other book Contradictions with more notes added to it. So at the end of every chapter there is reflections on contradictions, chapter, whatever, um, because Hal is giving more explanation about what's going on from what he talked about in his other book Contradictions. And this book, uh, Sense of Vacation, was published in 2017. So he has a lot more things that he's reflected on from his career and um, from when he wrote that last book into this new one. The writing throughout Sense of Occasion is very direct and forthright and you know that Hal Prince means business and I feel like you kind of get that from everything you know about him in his career as well, that he is very like direct and was very direct about everything he wanted to do in his career and said, you know what, I'm making this choice, it's going to be a strong choice and you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen, but I'm making it for myself, for my career, for the people I want to work with. It was very much of a go-getter and that's a big thing that you can see a lot in his writing. A lot of the stories that he tells in the beginning of the book are from an era of theater that I don't really know about with like... Ethel Barrymore and George Abbott and a lot of people that like I read about in theater history books and like see the theaters named after them in Times Square and all the, in the theater district and then I'm like oh Hal Prince who died this year and was a huge deal in the world of musical theater at like a young age got to work with these amazing people and be respected by them and get to work with them one-on-one -on -one. and I was, it was just like such an interesting concept to read about that because it's like all these people who seem kind of fanatical and like oh this, these are like the forefathers of theater you don't really know much about them except like what's written in the history books and like different things like that but reading somebody's first-hand accounts of interacting with all of them is pretty amazing. In chapter 5 of the book, specifically on page 36, Hal Prince is talking about the rehearsal process for West Side Story, which he worked on with Jerome Robbins and everybody who's involved with that show. And I've always heard rumors about the rehearsal store, rehearsal process for West Side Story, for the original production of it, because it's it was said that they kept the Sharks and the Jets very separate from each other to like really build up like the mentality of like you are not allowed to be with these people at all. And then reading that it actually was a real thing, I was like, okay, this is pretty interesting. So I wanted to read it to you guys as well. Robbins has been called a method director. Actually, he likes to dabble in it. He did in West Side and later in Fiddler. During the rehearsal process of West Side, he related the cast thoroughly to their gangs. Half were jets and half were sharks. They traveled in packs away from the theater. They were young and inexperienced, and identification improved their acting. West Side had no chorus. Each gang member had a name and history. Each cut out newspaper accounts of gang rivalries. They covered the rear walls of the Winter Garden stage with them. There was a character in the script called Anybody's, played by Lee Becker, who was rejected by both gangs, so the cast rejected her. Another section of the book that I wanted to share with you is about the financial side of theater, which is something that I don't understand as an actor, because it's not something I'm really thinking about at the current moment. Obviously, in the future, if I'm ever like creating a theater or running a show or something like that, I'll have to think about all of the financials that go into creating a show and keeping it running. But Hal Prince is very much involved in that world of theater, so he writes a lot about the financial side of it. So I wanted to read it to you guys. If you have to happen to read the book, it's on page 41. In the old days, we always gave everybody a raise the day a show returned its investment. We can't afford to do that anymore because the union is too busy ruling that a chorus person carrying a tray is in fact playing a waiter and must be paid accordingly. Or that somebody leeching or that somebody leaping inches off the stage in a dance is risking life and limb and is so entitled to hazard pay. We sit down and argue strenuously with these absurdities and ultimately it degenerates into my winning some points and losing others. And finally someone says to me, don't you understand these rules are not made for you, they're made for the crooks we have to deal with. And I can't help but think, why then don't you make special rules for me? And the last section of the book that I wanted to read to you guys is about casting and that actors have no clue what is going on in a director's head, which the way Hal writes it, I was like, okay, this makes a lot more sense when I'm going into an audition room because like, 
you really have no idea what a casting director or director or producer is thinking when they're in the audition room. It's just about anything that they could possibly think of that they need for the show. Judy Abbott, who was casting for us then, had seen Tom Bosley in an off-Broadway play at the Phoenix, I think. He did not look like the young Fiorella, but he was familiar to us. He was a young man, a little heavy, round, and jowly. Not really Fiorello, better than that. A caricature of Fiorello. He read for us countless times, so often in fact that each successive reading was a disappointment. This happens when an actor is obliged to re-audition for a role. Having little or no coaching from the director, the actor naturally surmises with each recall that he has been deficient in some particular, that the powers are looking for something additional, different from him, and so he searches in desperation for a new approach. And for every good reason, he gets further and further from the true intuitive choices he made originally. Such was the case with Bosley. Nevertheless, we stopped auditioning him in time and gave him the role. Then, too in the sense that the director has something in, in his mind as yet uncommunicated to the actor, it's sometimes impossible for an actor to give a pertinent audition. I'm thinking of Joel Gray in Cabaret. Gray, born in a trunk, singing in clubs and hotels since childhood, shared experience with the MC, recognized the gaucheries, the hollow laughter, the courage and vulnerability of a performing and a sputtering limelight. But our MC was middle-aged and German and androgynous, and all of this Gray or whoever had to convey with a few lines from an opening monologue and nothing more. No one could have auditioned specifically for that role. Instead, Gray sang and danced American style, and I told the authors I wanted him and to trust me. And they did. They don't always, but I've never been more certain of what I was asking, more willing to take full blame if it failed." There's a lot in reading Hal Prince's book that I've learned about what it's really like behind the table and in creating a show because as an actor, you never really know what's going on with the directors and how they're creating the show, producing it, directing it, what they want from an audition, any kind of thing that they're doing. But getting a little idea of that from Hal Prince, who was one of the like biggest deal people in creating a lot of the big musicals that we know, like Fiorello, Cabaret, Phantom of the Opera, many, 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 many other shows. It's very interesting to get more of a sense of that from his writing and from his real experiences with some of the most amazing people in theater. So that is all I have for you guys today for September's Book of the Month. If you have read Sense of Occasion by Hal Prince, let me know what you think of it in the comments down below. And if there are any other books you would like me to read, let me know about that in the comments down below as well. And as per usual, if there's anything you would like to see in particular on my channel, let me know about that in the comments down below as well. Thank you guys so much for watching, DFTBA, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.